Okay, uh, good afternoon, class. Can you guys hear? Yeah. You can see the screen as well, I hope. Yes, sir. Okay, so before I start, did everyone get a textbook? Download it and started reading the first chapter. All right. Let's start working on it. Can't do so much at once. <laughs> okay. So, but you downloaded the textbook at least. Yeah. Even yes, if you didn't read the chapter. <laughs> All right. So this um, little, little first PowerPoint is going to cover everything in the first chapter. You still need to read the first chapter. All right. But this is going to just give you like, just like a, a quick overview of everything. All right. Okay. Um, any questions? on like anything in general, because um, I saw an email with someone saying that they thought the class was at five instead of at six. So the class will be at six, okay, every Monday, All right? Okay, let's begin. So my name is Neil Chapter Paul. For those of you that don't know me, I'll be teaching this course. It's called ELE. L-E. 2115, okay. which is just the digital electronics course, digital techniques course for electrical engineers. Okay. In this course, we'll just go over a bunch of techniques that we use to design digital systems. And of course, you'll learn more about what digital systems are and how we can use them and apply them in our lives as we go throughout the course. <laughs> This first little lecture is just gonna be an introduction to all the things that you would cover throughout this course, all right? And as we go about moving through the different chapters in the textbook and you know, teaching more material, you'll learn a bit more in detail what these things are about, all right? So firstly, we should start by defining what a digital quantity is, what digital systems are, a little bit. Usually, digital quantities, digital systems are compared to analog quantities. Now, most natural quantities that we'd find in our everyday life are considered analog, right? When you think about temperature at a particular time of day, right? Now, the temperature varies throughout the day. Let's say we start at zero hours in a day, all the way up to... 12 o'clock in the night, right? So we start at 12 midnight, back to 12 midnight, 24 hours in the day. The temperature throughout the day would vary, right? Now, you would notice at any given point, right? The temperature is continuous and differentiable, which is like this nice smooth curve. If there's a change in temperature, the temperature never just suddenly changes rapidly. Like there's never like some sudden change like this, right? It wouldn't go from zero degrees all the way up to 100 degrees, right? There's any sudden sharp change. It's usually continuous and you can see that there's some sort of gradient, in it, right? Most analog quantities are like that, right? You can see the change in between, okay? Now, when it comes to a digital quantity, a digital quantity isn't as continuous, right? There are little spaces in between, breaks and gaps in between. So let's say we take the same analog quantity, right? That's continuous, where there are points at every given point in between. So at some point, like 430 even, you can know what the temperature is and at 445 and every single point in between. But for a digital quantity, we would usually discretize this, this signal or this this wave coming in, right? This function. And we take samples at particular points. For example, at here, 12 midnight, we take a one sample. Then at one, we take another sample. And at every hour, we take another sample. And we can discard the data, the rest of the data, at all the other points in between. And we can use this as some sort of quantized or a digitalized version of the signal saying that, okay, at 12, it's 75 degrees. At one, it's 73 degrees. 
at 2, it's 71 degrees, and so on and so forth, corresponding some particular time, 1 to some temperature value, right? A time 2 to some temperature value B, right? This basic corresponding values, right? Discrete. Okay. Now, we would notice is that we lose a little bit of information there, but that's okay, because even if we got Let's, let's use a sine wave as an example. So this here would be a sine wave, right? And we would discretize it. So our, our one point is gonna be zero. At another point is gonna be a little bit up. Another point is gonna be a little bit more up. Our point is gonna start going back down. Our point is gonna be zero. Going back down a little bit. Down some more, not as much, right? Even though we were missing it in between, right, we can still fill in the gaps and regenerate the old signal. Right? So what we would notice is that a digital signal, although it contains less information, we can still use it to regenerate the old signal. So this should just start giving you a little idea about the difference between an analog quantity and a digital quantity. Additionally, right? We can also discretize it along the perpendicular, uh, along the um, vertical axis. So let's use the same example of the, of the uh, sine wave. Right. So regularly, the sine wave would be like this, right? And we discretize it along the horizontal axis, right? We get something looking like this, right? and so on and so forth, right? I'm just taking some samples in between. Now we can also quantize it along the vertical axis, converting something that is a sine wave, or it looks like a sine wave, to something that's a bit more choppy and a bit more digital, okay? but it still essentially represents the same wave, right? This, if we were to zoom out a little bit, it's still essentially a sine wave. We're just a little bit of aliasing or missing information in between. Okay? Now, as we go through the course and you guys finally read the textbook, you can learn a little bit more about all the differences between analog quantities and digital quantities. All right? Yeah. Now, Now, analog systems versus digital systems. Now, the digital systems obviously uses, use digital signals. Generally, how the information is stored because we have corresponding values, like individual values, like a value like 22 and 23, corresponding to particular points in time, we can store these as binary numbers and then convert all our binary numbers into binary data. We can store them in, in terms of digital media, something like a CD or maybe a hard drive. So we take the actual quantities, right? All of the samples we took and we can convert them into binary information and we can store them on digital media, right? And utilize them. Now, when we think about how would we store an analog quantity, it might be pretty hard, right? Because all the information that we would leave out with the digital signal, right? All the bits of information that we leave out, we'd have to store if you wanted to store this analog signal perfectly, right? So that would take up way too much space and use up way too much resources. So that's one of the advantages of a digital system, right? We save some time. We're good. Now, in this case, this is a mixed system. This is part analog, from part analog, and part digital. So from your CD, digital information here is stored on the CD, and it would use some sort of laser optical diode to read the information of the CD, right? Now this digital data, as it's read off the CD, would be fed into something like a DAC, right? Digital to analog converter, 
short, you usually say da. And this da would start piecing the information back together, right? Creating an analog wave. So the same way we would have the, let's use a sine wave again. As an example, same way we'd have the samples here, right? The da would start piece the information back together, right? And generate back the original waveform. Now, with the dark piecing that back together, we can then move on to the analog system, which is a pretty system that you guys may have come across where we just take, take the signal in, we amplify it, and we play it through a speaker, right? Pretty simple. Okay? Now, they're fully digital systems which move from digital mediums to other digital mediums, right? Maybe you might have something like a calculator, right? There's a keypad. Keypad, you press a button, does some calculations, right? And then it would display on some sort of LCD display information. So it kind of goes from digital to digital, right? And there also are also some mixes in between the purely analog systems, purely digital systems, mixed analog and digital systems, right? Now, what you may have heard that I mentioned is that these digital systems work with binary digits, right? Now, binary digits, also known as bits, right? Bit is just like a contraction for binary digit, right? And if you may have maybe come across the binary number system before, you know that it really only has two levels, zero and one. As compared to our decimal number system, which has 10, 10 <laughs> numbers, decimal, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. No, sorry, not 9, not 10, up to 9, right? 0 counts as the first one, so 10 numbers, right? The decimal number system. The binary number system, binary, right, bi, meaning two, has zero and one, right? One, two numbers. Hmm. And the way we represent this in terms of our electronics with our transistors that act the switches is by just saying some things are either on or they're off. Now, we can, we can set it up either way. We can say that when something is on, right? it can be a one, and when that thing is off, it can be a zero. Or we can set it up the other way, which is a bit more common, which is that when something is on, that's a zero, and when the, the thing is off, that's a one. Depends on how you want to set up. One is called positive logic, and the other one is called negative logic. However, this one's more common. When it's on, it's one. When it's off, it's zero. Also, some other terms you might see, is that sometimes one is referred to as true and zero is referred to as false. And also one you might see being referred to as high and zero being referred to as low, right? So binary isn't that hard, only two numbers really, one and zero, all right? Now back again, to our electronics, the way we represent this is on and off, right? Now, when a system's on, it's gonna, it's gonna establish some sort of voltage across, maybe a five volts, which is pretty common. Another common voltage is 3.3 volts. And this is common across most diesel systems, okay? And when it's off, it's gonna display zero volts, right? Now, sometimes in your system, they might have a little bit of noise coming in and some other stuff. So you might see maybe 0 0.01 volts, a little bit of noise, a little bit of variance and error when representing the low bit. And same thing with the high, right? Sometimes you might not see a perfect five volts. You might see a 5.1 or a 4.9, depending on the system, right? But Essentially, when we're trying to represent this, these bits of data, we turn something on and we turn something off. How we do that is we use transistors. And from your previous electronics class, 
We have known that transistors can be used as switches. All right. Now, digital wave, of course, as you saw just now, we don't just want one bit coming in, right? We want a series of bits, like zero, one, one, zero, one, one. We want a series of bits that represent data, right? Because if we want to represent a really complicated waveform like this, we would need more than one bit, right? We want to represent large amounts of information, right? So the way we do that is by using digital waveforms, which are just these, these waves, these changes in voltages, right? That, that help convey information from one system to another. So they have two systems here. System one and system two, and they're connected by some sort of transmission medium. And this digital waveform, this wave, of changing voltages, pulsating voltages would be sent across, right? And this pulsating voltage is what conveys the information from one system to the other, right? Now, as I said before, the high voltage, right? That plus five voltage, plus plus five volts, or sometimes 3.3 volts, right? Would represent the high, and the zero would represent the low, right? Similarly, right? So this here would be an example of a pulse that would represent the binary one, right? Or true or high, whichever way you wanna to refer to it. And this here would be an example of a, of a pulse that would represent low, right? This here would be zero, right? Or false or low however you want to refer to it, okay? And these things are, are strung together and we use them to convey information. So it's kind of like a continuous pulse moving up and down, right? Okay, now, the thing is, these pulses aren't ideal. You might see here that it's represented by this straight rectangle, right? starting from zero and going all the way up to plus five and starting from plus five and dropping all the way down to zero, right? But these pulses aren't ideal like this, right? There's a reaction time built into our devices. With our transistor, right? When we change the signal here at the gate, the transistor doesn't immediately start to let allow, right? Electricity to flow, allow the current to flow, right? There's some amount of reaction time. The transistor needs time to react. So our pulse doesn't just go from zero all the way up to the five volts, right? Or the 3.3 volts. It doesn't just move from zero volts to five volts. It doesn't just ramp up that way. There's, there's some amount of time it takes to move up. So ideally, we would represent our system as this square pulse, but it's good to know that that's not actu what's actually happening on, on a more microscopic level, right? On a more fine, on a finer resolution, right? There, there's some amount of time that, that the system takes to ramp up and ramp back down. Those times are characterized as rise time and fall time. And these, of course, depends on the type of transistor you use. Some transistors switch faster than others, right? Some different transistor technologies are better than others, right? And the type of material that we use to make the transistor also comes into play. Additionally, again, because our systems aren't ideal, right? They're not this perfect square waveform. Maybe if you zoom out a little bit, right, on a more macroscopic level, they might appear this way. But there are also some, some other things going on, right? Things like overshooting and ringing, these little transients built into our built into our little, little pulse here, right? Our digital waveform. Right? So this here is what we think it look like on the ID level. But what's actually happening is a little bit of 
noise here and there, right? A little bit of transients. Sometimes you might get overshoot, right? It being a little bit higher than five volts, right? It might be some ringing, some oscillating up and down, some droop being under five volts, right? And again, some undershoot and some ringing. And, and also the time it takes to ramp down and ramp up. So our pulses aren't ideal. But for most of this course, we'll be treating them as ideal, right? Okay. So now, as we start looking at digital systems, it's important to have certain quantities that we can characterize your system by, right? Certain things like frequency, right? So as we get a, as we get a digital waveform coming in, right? A pulsating waveform coming in, things are going up and down, up and down, up and down. We want to know how fast they're changing, right? Your frequency, and that frequency helps tell us how much information is being conveyed because the faster it's switching from high to low, high to low, faster it's changing, switching up and down, switching bits, the more information is conveyed, right? So frequency helps tell us how much data is being transmitted, right? How we calculate frequency, which most of you might know from a physics, a physics class or two, right, is that F is equal to one upon T, where T is the period of that, of that wave. Right? So for example, in a sine wave, right? it goes up, it goes down, and it goes back up and then back down. And it repeats like this, right? On and on. So the period is the time it takes to complete one cycle. So that would be from this zero here to this value here, T. Because after this, it just essentially does the same thing. This here could be A, right? This part here, and this part could be B. And then after that T, it does the same thing, right? It repeats A and then it repeats B. So the period is from zero to T, whatever this time is. And that's the time. We put one over that period and we get the frequency, right? And you guys know mathematics, you know how to do algebra, you know to transpose. If you're given the frequency of a waveform, you can obviously find the time, okay? Just for completeness sake, let's, let's work this little example they have here, right? If the period of a repetitive wave is 3.2 gigahertz, oh, sorry. What is the period of a repetitive wave if the frequency is 3.2 gigahertz? So we can take out our calculators, right? We know the formula. We want to find T. We were given F as 3.2 gigahertz. So we just plug in the values. Nothing difficult. <laughs> T is equal to 1 divided by now 3.2 gigahertz. We, of course, we want it in its base units, right? We want it in hertz. So 3.2 gigahertz is 3200 megahertz, right? which is 200,000 kilohertz. And then you add on three more, three more zeros there and you get hertz, right? A really big number. So we just put that one divided by that really big number, right? So that's three, two, zero, zero. That's megahertz, right? That is kilohertz. And this is in hertz. Right, we press equal. And we get this value, right? Now, of course, this value here is in seconds. And we're going to have to multiply by 10 to the power of 9. And we can get it in a, by 10 to the power of uh, 12. And we can get it in picoseconds, right? So we just multiply by 1,000. And we get milliseconds. And so on and so forth. And we bring them back down to picoseconds, right? And of course, you can use your, uh, your little scientific notation, right? You don't need to uh, put all the zeros out. You can just do 3.2 times 10 to the minus 9 or something like that. 10 to the 9, sorry. 
Pause the play. Right. So, in addition to frequency, which, which is a property that we use to define our waveforms, there's also this thing called duty cycle. Now, duty cycle is the ratio of the pulse width, right? The width of the pulses, the width of the pulses to T, which is the period, right? You see, it does, again, A, and this part here we call B, and then after that, it just repeats A, and this part here we call B. Now, this signal here is just an example, and it's not conveying digital information, right? This here is a signal that we would refer to as a clock signal because it's just repeating and it's just essentially holding time, right? It's not changing much. It's just sending the same thing. Okay. But duty cycle is essentially just this property that represents, okay, what is the on time? How, how long is this pulse on? Like it's on for what duration? And how, how long is that with respect to the period of, of the pulse, right? So the duty cycle is essentially a representation of how much energy is being used or how much work is being done, right? As a ratio of, of the periodicness of this waveform. And this duty cycle is usually expressed as a percentage. So we can say DC, duty cycle, or however you want to write it is equal to Tw over T. Tw is the pulse width, right? And this here is generally expressed as a percentage. So let's use an example. Let's say the period of this waveform was one second, right? And the pulse width was 0 0.4 seconds. Keeping that in mind, using the formula, we would say that the duty cycle is 0 0.4 divided by one, right? Which is 10 over four, which is expressed as a percentage is 40%, right? Should make sense. Again, not a very difficult formula. Let's put them together and you should be able to calculate duty cycle. Okay. Now, as I was saying earlier, this, this wave is pretty simple, right? It doesn't convey much information, right? Just moving up and down. There isn't really change. It's a path into it. So no information is held within this, within this signal, right? This is, this is what is referred to as a clock signal. It's just used to keep time between two systems, right? Now, this here is a time diagram. And this will essentially display the usefulness of a clock signal. So when we think of information coming in, right? Highs represent ones, lows represent zero, right? Now, for this signal here, signal A, it's pretty easy to see what's going on, right? This high here is a one. This low here is a zero, this high here is a one, this low here is a zero, so on, so forth, right? One, zero, one, zero, one, zero. However, signal B, things are a little bit different, right? This low here is a zero, great. This one here is a one. However, you notice that this one has an extended duration, right? So this one is actually two ones. And this low here, which is a really long low, is actually two zeros. And this high here is a really long high, is actually two ones. So it's zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, right? So how do we differentiate signal A from signal B, right? How does a system know? Remember a system, this has some sort of a transmission medium, maybe a wire or something, and the signal is just coming in. It doesn't know whether this is, this here could just as easily just be zero 
This one here could be one, one. This two zeros here could be one, zero. And this two ones here could be one, one. It doesn't know. How it knows is by using the clock signal. The clock signal says, hey, for this one period, that's one bit. This other period here, that's another bit. This other period here, there's another bit. This other period here, there's another bit. So it helps separate the signal out, right? Helps sync, sync up two systems. So we might have two systems. System one, right? And system two, we have a clock signal in between them, right? A clock signal, and then the actual data signal, right? So the clock signal says, okay, I'm gonna send a bit in this time. And then after that is another bit. So when this bit comes in zero, this other system knows that, hey, after this, it's another bit, right? So in this case, when it's one, even though it stays at one, there is no change. The other system knows that, hey, this is another bit. So that means that it's another one, right? So you can see how this clock signal is useful, right? In conveying information because not all information is going to be one zero one zero one zero right binary numbers change right and they represent different information and this is even more clear in this third third waveform here this third digital waveform here c which is according to the timing grid diagram according to the clock signal is zero 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 one 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 okay So these are timing diagrams, right? They essentially set up the same way like this with these dashed lines, the clock signal, and then you plot your signals here. And it's used to just compare the relationship between a few digital waveforms, right? So you can see what's going on. All right. Now, just now I talked about communication, right? I talked about something like system A here and system B, right? Now, how we transmit that data could either be in two forms, right? It could either be serially, which is one bit after the other, right? So in this case, zero, one, zero, zero. Remember here, like a little, a little clock signal is also being passed alongside this, telling them, hey, that this here is two bits, one, one, zero, one, right? So we convey it bit after bit after bit after bit. And this here is serial transfer, right? Serial communication, okay, one bit after the other. Alternatively, there's parallel communication, right? Where we transfer it parallelly over multiple lines. So information like this, which is one zero one one zero zero one one, would be transmitted over individual lines. So this one here would be transmitted over its own line, the zero here, <laughs> over its own line, this one here, own line, this other one here, own line, this other zero here, own line. Each, each bit has its own line, right? And of course, there's a separate line for the clock signal, right? The clock signal. Usually we just operate under the assumption with these block diagrams that the clock signal is established and both, both sides know that a clock signal exists, right? Now, when you wanna send information, usually we group it in bits of eight, like things like we'd send four bit information. So we'd send this, then we'd send another four bits, then we'd send another four bits, right? Or we'd group it in groups of eight, or 16 or 32, right? And you'll understand why we go from four, eight, 16 and 32 when we start doing binary numbers, right? But now just take it for gospel. So in, in this situation, after we collect the first eight bits, right? Then the other eight bits are gonna come. In this situation, we're gonna collect all eight bits one time Right, all eight bits one time. And then after that, the second set of bits are gonna come, right, again. So this here is serial 
transmission, serial communication versus pilot communication. One thing that you should note is that this here only needs one connection, right? One connection. This here needs eight, or depending on the number of bits, how you group the bits. If it's by, if it's by four bits, by eight, or by 16, right? So this here would need one bit, one line, one line, and this here would need eight lines, right? So this here, you need more connection. But the transfer, right, is that this here is faster, right? So this here is eight times as fast. This here is eight times as fast. Right? And the reason for that is quite obvious because this here is the time it would take to transfer one bit. And you see that we transfer all at the same time instead of doing one after the other. So this here would take whatever it is delta T is, the time for one bit, it would take delta T times eight on whichever seconds to transmit one bit the versus this here would just take delta T. Okay. Any questions so far? I know I just throwing a lot of information at you guys, but any questions so far? Yes, sir. Um, okay. the series transfer is um slow, but um less space, and the um the yeah. parallel transfer has a bit more space. Yes, but, but it I'm takes up more light. Wait. Okay. Sir. Yep, I can hear you. Wait, no. I want to write down, we, we just said it earlier. You see your trans is slower, right? Yep, it's slower. All right. What the wave is irregular wave now, sir? What do you mean irregular wave? Like, and they up high all the way from T0 to T3, then I go to Makalo. You know, yeah, well, well, you see, well, you see, aside, aside from this transmission line, aside from this transmission line, this TX, RX line, there's also a clock, a clock signal, right? Which, as long as you establish communication between two, two a transmitter and receiver, you should also have a clock signal that helps synchronize both of them, telling them, okay, this is a bit, this is a bit, and you see here, the zero, zero. It helps split that up and establish that, okay, this is one bit and this is another bit, right? There's, there's an additional clock signal set up in between these two. Okay? And Why that... Yeah, and that... Slower? Because it's one line, right? Remember, it has to send one bit, then another bit, then another bit, right? And it takes time, right? So T0 to T1, T1 to T2, T2 to T3, right? Versus this, which sends all the bits. Each bit has their own line, and it goes from T0 to T1, right? So all the bits get transferred over one time versus this is sequential, right? This bit has to wait on that, on, on that bit to finish, then this one is gonna go, then that one's gonna go, then that one's gonna go, right? It's like, let's say you got a bowl of M&Ms, right? And you pick up one after the other. You eat one, then you eat another one, then you eat another one, versus you just pick up a whole handful and put all in your mouth, right? So if you pick up a whole handful and put all in your mouth, that's parallel. If you take your time and eat one at a time, one M&M &M at a time, that's cereal, all right? Make sense? Okay, and each one of these um, things have got their own clock space, right? Yeah, the, yeah. It's now the clock might be independent of this. This here might be connected to the internet, right? might be connected to the internet, which downloads sometime from some universal clock. And this here, computer, might also be connected to the internet, which downloads some, some kind of universal clock, clock, right? Time. So it doesn't need to be a physical connection or a wireless connection. It doesn't need to be direct connection in between the two, but they should know, they should have some sort of standard established, some sort of protocol established, right? To help, help them set up some kind of timing system to differentiate one bit from another. So wait, sir. The more also they can have... what? All right, no, continue, sir. Continue. I thought you finished. No, also there can be something like some special sequence of bits, right? 
it, it might that that cause these two systems to sync up. So for example, they might send a continuous five volts, right? And then a continuous zero volts, and then rapidly switching at a way higher frequency, five to zero volts for like a few seconds to synchronize the system and say, hey, at this point, I'm going to start sending data, right? The moment this, this rapidly switching signal stops and we start continuing zero, we're going to send some sort of set, set sequences of bits, right? Maybe some information saying that, okay, the system's okay. And from, from this time on, we're going to send information that, that you know, contains data at this particular frequency, right? So if so, that way, they can kind of establish a frequency in between them, and there are all sorts of advanced protocols that computers use to help establish this synchronization in between them, right? So that they they both know which bit is which, all right? It can get pretty advanced, but for now, you can simply just think of it as a line, right, with some kind of clock signal, helping it to differentiate the bits. Right. Makes sense. A little bit, sir. I'm trying. So wait, sir, does this mean the more ports you have, the faster your data transfer? The more what? The more ports that you have. Like how the like how the complexity prints. I got like three, six, seven, eight lines. Does that mean well it, it means you have more ports, you ports have to transfer eight. information, right? Okay. Let's say on your computer, right? You got one USB port A, USB port B, and USB port C. Now, you got a bunch of files and you got one flash drive. If you just plug in one flash drive into serial port A, it's gonna transmit with that speed, right? Right. But if, let's say you got multiple files and multiple flash drives, right? Then you can plug up each to a different port and you can transfer the same amount of files faster. Are you breaking up? Right? And you can transfer the same amount of files faster. It's just that they would be coming over different well, channels, right? Over different lines. Huh? Hello? Can you guys hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, Sorry, are you fine, sir? Yeah. Sorry, are you clearly? I guess it's my internet and it's on me on stable. Okay. Well, I recorded in the class so you guys can watch it. And of course, remember, if you aren't quick enough to write down that parallel is faster and serial is slower, right? All of this information is inside the textbook. All you need to do is read that textbook, right? So, so all this information is inside the textbook. It's the same information I'm just giving it to you guys, right? So take some time, open the textbook, right, and read it. Okay, moving on. I feel like we spend enough time on serial and parallel communication. If you guys still got questions, you can always ask me in the next class after you read the textbook. Okay, now, apart from communication, right? We got system A, right? And we have system B. And it communicates and they're talking to each other, a lot of stuff going on. But what is going on inside system B? What's going on inside system A, right? Like, what's going on? Inside of them are logic gates. These logic gates help us to perform logical operations. Now, maybe in terms of calculator, right? We're going to press a button into some system, right? That's going to send some signal into the system and say, okay, the guy pressed nine. We wanna transfer this maybe into some sort of other system that adds numbers and says, okay, take nine and take another number, maybe coming from some other system, right? eight, take nine and eight, add them up and send that information, send the, the, the sum of these two numbers, which is 17, to some other system, right? 10 to 17, and then send the 17 to something that's going to display it out on LCD display, right? So how we perform all these operations, right, is by using logic gates. Now, modern computers are very complex, and they use millions and millions of transistors. 
throughout this course, we're just going to use a few. We're going to start building some basic digital systems. We're going to do things like, like I said before, like add count stuff, do some multiplexing, right? And some other basic functionality. And you learn all the, all the, all the things you need to build them from the ground up, right? So from the logic gate level, we're going to use these logic gates to build these systems, adders, multipliers, multiplexers, demultiplexers, counters, shift registers, things to store information and stuff like that, right? Of course, you're not gonna be building computers by the end of this, but you should have a fair understanding of what it takes to build a computer, right? So now, before we learn all that, right? Before we learn how to build an adder, before we learn how to build a demultiplexer, we first gotta learn about logic gate. Now, you may have come across this before, maybe in a maths class, maybe in a physics class. This is just, this is just a basic introduction. Three logic gates, the AND gate, the OR gate, and the NOT gate. Now, the AND gate is only true if all the input conditions are true. So we got multiple signals coming in. If for some reason, all the signals are high, all the signals are true, or all the, all the lines are on, indicated on, then out, coming out this end, is gonna be a one, right? This one here, of course, we know on a much lower level is actually the five volts or the 3.3 .3 volts, right? And that's the AND gate, right? All the inputs need to be true for this output to be on. If even one of the input is not true, is not true, let's say the second line is a zero or is a false, then here it's not gonna be on, it's not gonna be true, it's gonna be zero. Any one of these are off, it's, it's off, it's game over, right? It's not gonna turn on. All of them need to be high for this one to be high. Now, a question that you might ask is that how, how do the, where do these logic gates come from? Well, these logic gates are actually built from transistors, right? So we take transistors, we string them together in, in a certain way, which I will go over, or maybe I might give as an assignment for you guys to do, to make these logic gates, right? So we string them together and we make a logic gate, and then we use the logic gate to perform a logical operation. So inside this logic gate are transistors, right? A bunch of transistors doing these things, collecting this and making outputs, right? Another logic gate is the OR gate. Now it's true if one or more of the inputs are true. So if all of this, these inputs are zero, the output's gonna be zero. But if any one of them, right, is one, this here is gonna turn off, is gonna turn on, right? So the OR gate compared to the AND gate is very easy to turn on, right? Just one of these, only one of these, and it could be anyone. It doesn't have to be this bottom one, right? It could be the top one. As long as any of them are on, then, you know, for the output, that output is gonna be high, right? And, and even if all of them are on, it's still gonna be high, right? One or more. As long as one of more of them are on, the output's gonna be on. Only way to turn off is for all of them to be off. Right? All of them to be off. Yeah. Pretty simple. And of course, we'll go over this, we'll go over more in depth, and we'll look at a bunch of other logic gates, right? The XOR gate, right? The exclusive OR gate, the NAND gate, right? And all these, all these other fancy gates, right? We're going to be looking at. I'm going to look at the truth tables for them and, and how they work and so on and so forth. This is just a brief introduction. Again, this other gate is called a NOT gate, right? Essentially what it does is it flips the bit, right? If a one comes in, a zero goes out. If a zero comes in, a one comes out, right? So it just flips the bit. This, this is also something that we might call an inverter because it inverts the bit. So one gets inverted to zero. So you might hear that, you might not hear not gate, you might hear inverter, right? 
sometimes. And it's also a gate that we use as a buffer, right? Buffer. So when transmitting data along long transmission lines, right? We find that, let's say the signal started here with five volts, it might droop a little bit, right? And it might come down to, to 4.8. Now, four, maybe it might be a nice clean signal, right? But some noise might be introduced along the way. So what we do is we would usually put two NOT gates, right? We put two NOT gates in series to help regenerate that signal, right? So this one here, would we flip into zero, then we'd flip back into one. Within these two NOT gates, nothing is really happening. One's going in and one's coming out. The same information is going and coming out. But this little, this little sequence here is, is called a buffer and it can be help and it can be used to help combat noise or regenerate the signal. Of course, again, we'll learn more about this as we progress throughout the course. All right. Any questions on any of these gates? Before we move on. Um, sir, 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 <coughs> sir um, can you um, go over the um, OR gate, sir, please? Okay, so the OR gate, once again. Unlike the AND gate, which needs all of the inputs, every single one to be on in order for it to be on, the OR gate only needs one of them, right? So anyone, any one of these lines, you put the one here, you put the one here, or you put the one here, this thing is going to turn on. If all the others are low, right, but only one of these lines are on, it's going to be on. If two of these lines are on, it's going to be on. Three are on, it's going to be on. All of them are on, it's going to be on. The only way to not make, make it be on is to turn all of these lines off, right? All of them need to be off. The first one, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one, right? All of them need to be off. That's the only way you can get it to turn off, right? You get it now? Yes, yes sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, thanks. All right. Just give me a few minutes. Let me grab some water real quick. All right, so I'm back. Right. So just now we talked about these, uh, these logic gates. And I've been saying from the start of the course that we take transistors, right? These transistors, and then we use them to make logic gates. And then we use the logic gates now to make these functional blocks, these basic system functions, these functional blocks. These functional blocks are the blocks that actually do things, things that like do arithmetic or compare signals, right? Like we want to know if this signal is the same as that signal, right? That multiplex and demultiplex information, right? And that, that count bits that are coming in, right? all these different uses that we might have. So you go from transistors to logic gates, and we use the logic gates to build the functional block. So within these functional blocks, all of them that I'm, that I'm gonna go over, the comparator, the adder, right? Inside of them are just a bunch of logic gates, right? That take in the information, does some operations on them and spits it back out, right? Good. Now, 
the first functional block is called the comparator. The comparator is fairly simple, right? Now, this is, a, this is an example of a fairly simple two-bit comparator, right? Notice I say two-bit. It's just going to take in two binary numbers, right? Binary number A and binary number B. Of course, these binary numbers, this here could be a 16-bit number. And this here could also be a 16-bit number. And you could compare them, right? Depending on the, I guess, the level or the, I don't, I don't know how you would say it, the, the, the word size or the bit size of these comparators, they can take larger numbers or smaller numbers, right? And we would design that based on our logic gate inputs and outputs or whatever. But essentially, the basic functionality of a comparator is that we would take one number, one binary number A, and a binary number B, and we would see if they're the same number. Now notice here, we got two input lines, input line one and input line two, and for the output lines, we got three of them, right? We got this one here, we got this one here, and this one here. Now, based on whether or not A is equal to B, each one of these lines might be high, right? So if A is the same number as B, then this second line here is going to light up one. If A is greater than B, then this first line here is going to light up one. And if A is less than B, right, then this third line here is going to light up one, right? So for the case where A is less than B, this third line here is going to light up one, and the other lines are just going to be low. In the case where A is equal to B, this second line is going to light up one, and the others are going to be low. Of course, as we go on in the course, you might find comparators where it's kind of inverted a little bit, where, for example, if A is equal to B, here is going to be zero, and these two are going to be one. So it's inverted in a way, right? But we'll, we'll talk more about that. So that's a comparator. All it does compares two binary numbers, A equal to B, A greater than B, or A less than B. Depending on that, the outputs change. Right? Another functional block. The other, what this does, right, is it adds two binary numbers. Binary number A comes in. Binary number B comes in into this adder, the adder, adder adds up A and B, right? And it outputs sum of that. So let's say A was one. A was one, but of course in binary form, right? So it'd be zero, 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 one, or something like that for like a four bit system. And binary number B was let's say, Three, so that would be something like zero zero one one, right? In in a binary in a four bit binary system, right? So we take the numbers one and three, right? One and three, and it would add that up, and we would get four, and four is what would be output here, right? It is what would be outputted here. Now we would also notice is that it just carry, and that's because sometimes in binary operations like for these two. These two here would add up to 0, 1, 0, 0, right? And sometimes you might have an extra bit that spills over. For example, you remember back in primary school when you used to add numbers, you used to add, add a number like 8 and 7, right? 8 and 7 is 15, right? And this here, this 1 here would kind of be carrying over into the 10 side. So in, in binary, systems right in these digital systems the amount of bits are set so sometimes when we add in really big numbers we might get a bit a flows over the same way this one flow over into the tens column the same way a bit might flow over and that extra bit usually comes out this here this carry this carry port here 
right? So let's say we were adding seven and eight, right? Seven plus eight, right? The five would come out here and the one would come out here, right? So that would just go and then you would see 15, right? This one here would be considered the tens, this fives here would be considered the ones. Of course, we'll go over the binary number system. And as we start building adders, this is gonna make more sense. Sorry, any any, any questions on these two? No. Nope. I just I just joined. I was having problems with laptop. Okay, no problem. Is it recording? I'll send it to you guys, and you can look at it on your own time. All right. So I really understand the um the addition the four bits um the four bits addition like we're adding binary four bits uh, the, you're like like adding a lot then how do you say you're doing it again okay so in the second chapter and the next class we, we're gonna i think we're gonna look at logic gates for the next class and then the class after that we look at the binary number system right i'm, I'm not too sure which chapter it is but we will get to how you add binary numbers like you might see a number like this you might see a number like this and you're like okay how is that this equal to this right you might want to know how do we add these binary numbers right all of that is in the textbook and we will go over it in class this here is just your first class right i can't give you everything i can't teach you how to add and multiply and subtract binary numbers yet right there's a lot that goes into it right all right sir yeah Okay, so bear with me. In the third class, we will be adding and subtracting binary numbers and doing all sorts of stuff with them, right? Good. Now, some more functional blocks, right? Again, inside of these are a bunch of logic gates. Two more functional blocks, encoders and decoders, right? Now an encoder. This take some sort of input, right? Remember, we got multiple input lines, right? And it says, okay, this one goes. He's pressing the number nine. Now, here, all of these numbers might be connected to some switch, right? And when you press this, it closes the switch and sends a voltage to this line, right? It might be set up like that. So when that high comes in here at nine, the encoder knows, okay, he's pressing the number nine. What we want to do is moving from this physical decimal world where the person presses the number nine, we want to encode that right into the digital world where we use binary numbers. So the number nine, right, is going to be, I think it's one zero zero one or something like that. I'm not too sure, right? It's going to encode that into a binary number, right? It's going to move from the decimal from number nine and it's going to encode that. It's going to convert this nine into this, this binary number, right? Conversion. Encoding the information into the digital world. Now, sometimes we might want to move from a digital, from, from the digital system. After we finish doing the operation, maybe we might have add two numbers together or, you know, compare some signals or do some other thing. Then we want to convert this, this digital information back, back to something that you could understand. For that, we will use the decoder, right? That would take something like this binary information here, this 101, and it would light up some, some corresponding lights on this seven segment display, right? So this seven segment display here has seven LEDs, LED, one LED, two LED, three, four, five, six, seven LEDs, right? And based on what number is coming in here, for example, the number nine is gonna light up the corresponding segments, right? So each one of these LED, LEDs here, LED segments corresponds to a line and it's gonna send some information, maybe one, 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 saying turn all on, right? For example, the number eight, right? Eight, turn all of these on. So turn this one on, turn this one on, 
This one, this one, this one, this one, and this one lighting up the number eight. But for the number two, it's gonna send a different binary number saying, okay, turn this one on, 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 lighting up here, the number two, right? It's here decoding the binary information to something useful in the physical world, right? So that, that there is just a simple example of an encoder and a decoder. Of course, they can get way more complex and we can do more things with that. Okay. Any questions on these two before I move on? No? Yeah, so um, this is the fundamentals for, for what we're learning here. Yeah, yeah, basic, basic stuff. Okay. We'll start building um, the me, sir. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, um, I understand from the encoding function when if the person press nine, it would like signal the, or um, it would show one to the line that this mm -hmm. person press nine, sir. Mm -hmm. So, um, how we end up from the decoder to eight, sir? I don't really understand this eight thing or. Okay, so this here, some binary information would be coming in, right? Some, let's say the number three, right? So zero, zero, one, one. This here is binary for three, right? Which, which we're gonna learn the number system eventually, right? You're gonna learn the binary number system. And if you want, you can read ahead, do a little research, watch some YouTube videos and learn about binary numbers beforehand, right? But this here is the binary number three, right? Now, in order to display this, this number three on this seven segment display, right? I don't know if you've ever seen a seven segment display before. Let me see if I can find one. All right. All right, if you've ever seen displays like this, right? If, if you look closely, it's kind of the same thing that we have. Hmm. Uh, so what, what display you call it? Seven, seven segment. segment display, yeah. Oh. It's like this. If you look closely, it's the same thing we have here, right? Because there's seven different LEDs and each oh. one of them we light up, right? And it would kind of light up showing like this, right? Displaying numbers, oh. right? Displaying numbers like this. So 3.1415926, right? Displaying pi. So... To represent the number three, right, in, in this seven segment display, we need to light up this one, right? We need to light up this segment, this segment, this segment, and this, right? You, you, you see the tree starting to form, right? Yeah. You seeing it? Good. So we need to light up that. So what the decoder does is it say, okay, binary number three, okay, what? what segments do I need to light up, right? I need to light up segment A, segment B, segment C, D, and E, and it's gonna send the ones to these corresponding lines to light up these segments, right? Displaying the number three, right? So it converts this number three, decodes this number three, into these segments, into these, into this other number that lights up particular segments. Make sense now? Yes. yes? Good. Of course, we will learn how to build the decoder. Okay. Another thing. Some more functional box, right? So encoders, decoders, count, um, Comparators, others. We we starting to learn about all the different things we can do with these digital systems, with these logic gates, right? Mm -hmm. Multiplexers and demultiplexers, right? Yes, sir. Uh, come back. You you are question? Oh um yeah I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's the same person who I was asking the question. Um, my eight minute come up, so come on, leave it. So now join him. What question were you asking? With the um, decoder, sir. Oh, I, I explained that just now. Um, 
we we watched the video i explained it i don't want to waste too much time going off going back no, oh, I, okay okay sir all right you sure and and if you still need help on it right ask me again in the next class and i'll spend a few minutes and go over it again all right okay sir no problem good so now two more functional blocks multiplexer demultiplexer sometimes shorthand we will write mox and dox right or demox demox right multiplexing and demultiplexing they're kind of analogous to modem right modem which is modulator demodulator but they're not really modulating and demodulating anything they're just multiplexing stuff so they're switching between different data lines so let's say we had three inputs coming in three different signals coming in right signal a signal b and signal c and signal a b and c need to be transmitted to three different systems right system d system e and system f right three different blocks maybe or three different systems however we only have one transmission line one line to transmit all three of these signals what we can do is time share this line right so how time sharing works, let's say maybe you live in the house and you guys only have one computer and it's you and your three brothers, right? You can say, okay, the oldest brother could use the computer in the morning, right? So the oldest brother could use the computer from eight to 10 and the other brother can use the computer from 10 to 12 and the other one from 12 to two and the other one from two to four, right? So we can time share, we can say, okay, you could use it for now, then I'm gonna use it, then this other person's gonna use it, then this other person is gonna use it, right? So demultiplexing and multiplexing is kind of the same way. We're time sharing this line, this line. Of course, this isn't happening like from eight o'clock to 10 o'clock. This is happening at, at, at really rapid speeds, right? nanoseconds even right so it's switching between each of these very fast very fast right and we could say for some time delta t which is arguably very small right we're gonna connect up a to d we're gonna connect up line a right transmitting from here signal a right up to d right which is what we want to do Right. Or and then, time. Yeah, well, it's time dedicated to a particular configuration, right? Which is A to D. So A is going to be connected up to D for some delta T, which is yeah, change in time. Delta is just a is just a symbol that represents the change in time, right? Some sort of duration in this case. Right? So another duration for another period. Of course, the period is very small, right? Because these are computers, these are electronics that switch very fast. We're going to connect up some very small period, B to E, and then C to F, and then A to D again. And we're going to move, move, move through like that, right? We're going to move from A to D, right? This is going to switch and this is going to switch. And from B to E, and then switch again from C to F. And we're going to switch, right? So what you would find is that over this line, the signals are multiplexed, right? We get this signal here, right? Being attached to this signal here, right? Which is also attached to this signal here, right? So they kind of attach to each other and it's up to the, right? When they're attached to, to each other, we say that they're multiplexed. And it's up to the demultiplexer to, to say that, okay, 
this part here, signal A, then from this part here, disconnect, connect to E, because this part here, right, is signal B, connect up to E, and then disconnect, because this part here is C, so connect up to F. It's up to the B multiplexer to separate that signal back up. So we multiplex the signal, right? String them along, string them up together, and the B multiplexer is going to switch and is going to divide up this signal equally, or at least divide up the signal as necessary, right? For this system. Okay, makes sense, right? Yeah, sorry, follow. Good. And of course, there, there, there are a little odd inputs that come into play. Maybe there might be a clock, right? Connecting up the two. Uh, and it might time? be a clock, clock signal, oh, yeah. clock signal, syncing, syncing the two. And there might be some, maybe some bits communicate to each other, some external in input, right? Some external device that, that essentially controls how these, how these things are connected up. So we can have just this one line and we can have our device changing different functions, right? So we can switch from a device being an adder to a subtractor to a multiplier divider. We can switch connecting up different functions, right? Right, we can switch, we can have some external input deciding which parts of different circuitries are connected up to each other, right? So, so we can control this process or we can leave it independently and have some sort of some sort of progressive sequential clock signal just having it switch based on a set time that we generate. I saw in the chat, Billy was asking if this clock signal is usually set by a crystal oscillator. And yes, crystal oscillators are used to create oscillating waves, right? They're, they're oscillators. And we use that as a timing signal to pulse devices on and off. So yeah, in a lot of electronics, you're gonna find crystal oscillators and these crystal oscillators help gener to generate that clock signal, All right? Okay, Billy. Okay. So, so far we learned comparators. We learned adders. Well, we didn't learn them. We learned about them. We learned encoders. Decoders, multiplexers, demultiplexers. And now another one, which is the counter. The counter is very simple. What it does is it counts the number of pulses coming in. So let's say we were working in a factory and there's some sort of conveyor belt. And on this conveyor belt, bottles are coming in, right? Bottles are coming in. And we have some sort of sensor here, some sort of sensor that senses the number of bottles that pass. Every time a bottle pass, it would send a pulse. It would send a pulse. So a counter would essentially just be sitting here and it would count the pulse. It would be like one pulse. Then the second pulse come in, okay, two, two, the number is two now, and it would keep moving on, right? So when five bottles pass or six bottles pass, the counter is just gonna be sitting here keeping count, saying, okay, six bottles pass, seven bottles pass, right? And then it's gonna output that in, in binary, right? It's gonna output the binary number. But that's six, and this six, of course, we could wrap it up into some system and then output that number six onto some sort of display, right? Maybe, again, you might want to use another seven-segment display or something more advanced, right? An LCD display. So you can be counting, counting the number of bottles that come in, right, from the conveyor belt. And you can just display the number on some sort of seven-segment display in another part of the factory displaying that number. So that there is a, a simple example of a digital system, right? 
some sort of display keeping track of the number of bottles produced that day, right? Good. And as a counter. Moving on. All right, so now, I guess from the factory example, you can kind of get an idea of how digital systems are used in our everyday lives, right? If we can create a calculator, that's good. If we can create something that counts and displays the number of bottles produced in a factory, then maybe we can create just about anything using these digital systems, right? We just need to figure out what functional blocks we need to use and just string them together and create that system. Now, another necessary feature is to be able to store information. Usually we store information by means of a shift register. Shift register and also flip-flops. Okay. Flip, flip-flops, right? Which is another way to store information. And of course, we learn exactly how those work a little bit later on, later on in the course, right? Okay. Now, a shift register is essentially something that just stores the information, right? So let's say we want to store this binary number, 1010. One, zero. We want to store that in this four bits shift register, right? Four bits. Why is it called a four bit shift register? Because it only has space for four bits, right? So you want to store this information in this four bit shift register. How this information is going to be stored is that it's going to be coming in. The first bit is going to be stored in this first register. Now, the reason it's called a shift register is because the data is shifted down from one register to the other and to the other, to the other, right? So you can imagine you're in a mini bus, right? And they got so much people in the bus, right? Let's say they got a bit here, right? Zero and one. And then the bus pull over and another person got yeah. come in, right? The conductor might say, okay, all right, you go down a little bit, make some space, small up yourself, right? So this yeah. bit here is actually gonna That's move right. down in the bus, and this one here is going to take its spot, it's going to move down so that this new, new bit, this new person could come inside the bus, right? So the bits are shift down, all right? So let's go over that again, okay? We want to get this number into the register. One, the bus pull up, this, this guy is going to come in. Next position, the bus pull up, right? This guy needs to shift down take this spot, and then this person here yeah, is going to yeah. come in. The bus pull up, right? Here, this, this person needs to shift down, this person needs to shift down, and in order for this person to come, come in, right? So that person's going to be there, this one's going to shift down, this one's going to shift down, and that person's there, right? Now, for the last one, this person needs to shift down, that person needs to shift down, this person needs to shift down, for this one to come in, right? So it's going to fill up the four with shift register. Make sense? Yes. No, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. All right. Now, how do we actually build stuff? Well, we don't go buy a bunch of transistors, solder them up together, and say, okay. We build, finally built an AND gate, and then we don't just go and solder up a bunch, bunch of these transistors that we built into AND gates together, and then, okay, we finally build an adder, right? We usually just buy ICs that contain a bunch of adder, right? So an IC, an integrated circuit, would come in these packages like this, right? An IC is just some circuit, right, with some, some chip, that has a bunch of transistors already in it lined up in some particular way, right? So let's just quickly search integrated circuit. Okay. 
right? So these are what ICs look like, right? These little chips. They generally come in this package here, which is called the package, the jewel inline package. It would just has two rows of pins, right? So that this these chips here, right? These are the dip chips, dual inline package, two lines, right? Dual lines with a bunch of pins. And essentially they would come along with some sort of wiring diagram showing that, okay, this, these pins here are actually connected up to this OR gate here, right? Remember the symbol for OR gates, if we were to go back up. Right, remember this symbol here, right? So you gotta remember the symbol, hope you learn the symbol, right? So each pin corresponds to different inputs of the OR gate. So you would send in your signals through here. And if you wanna OR those two things together, then you would, this here would be the output that these parts would be the input, right? And you would string these together. Of course, this is, this is a very simple one with only four AND gates, right? It can be more complex. You can have more AND gates inside, or you can just buy chips that are, that, that are just like, okay, this chip is a four bit adder. This chip is a four bit shift register already pre-built, right? You don't need to go buying a bunch of transistors and, and wiring up them up together, right? These things are already pre-manufactured. They generally come in, come like this, right? In these ICs. So when you want to physically build these things, you would just go out and buy an IC and then solder up the IC, right? Okay. This is just a picture showing what, what that uh, dip chip would look like on a breadboard, right? There are also a lot of different packages, right? The dip, again, dip. IC is not the only way, dual inline package is not the only way they can come. They can come in SOIC, small outline IC, which is slightly a bit different. Okay. Want a more realistic view of that? You can go SOIC. Okay. See, this, this is what it looks like, and you can mount them on special types of circuit boards, right? Maybe some PCB stuff, and you can solder them up. Or you might use some sort of machine, so machine to do the soldering. Right, placing a component because these might be a bit more difficult to solder, right? And and build your uh, your circuit, whatever it is you're planning to design, right? And some surf surface mount stuff, right? Uh, see if I can show something like that. Right, surface mount ICs, which are a bit different, right? And they got a lot more pins and a bit more complex, right? A lot more inputs and up, a lot more pins, a lot more stuff going on, and it's very thin. So these here, you're probably not going to be soldering this by hand, right? Okay, good. And then you wire all the stuff up, connect all the stuff up, and you have your digital system designed to do whatever it is you designed it to do. Okay, and good. Now, some useful instruments when designing digital systems, when doing digital electronics. One device, which you guys should know, is, an, is just a general purpose oscilloscope, which we know is just something we would connect up some leads. And we connect those leads to different parts of our circuit, and we'd use that to test the voltage, right? One thing that you need to make sure you do is set up the DC coupling, right? DC coupling. Now, the difference between that, let's say we have some digital wave coming in. This here is your, uh, your time axis and your voltage axis, right? Now, if we don't set up this DC coupling, the digital wave form might actually come in like this. Right, and this here might be displayed as 2.5 volts, and this here might be displayed as minus 2.5 volts. Right, 
when this is one and this is zero. So what we need to do is set it to DC coupling and that triggers some, some circuitry inside the oscilloscope and moves this signal up to like here and here which is where we want the zero part to be at and where we want the one part to be at, right? We want it to be five volts and this zero part to be zero volts, right? So the DC coupling helps make sure that we read it the way we want to read it, right? You don't really need to know exactly what's happening inside the oscilloscope. Just know that if you're ever reading digital signals, go ahead and turn on DC coupling, right? You don't, you don't really need to know all of this stuff, right? But you can learn it if you want to. Okay. Another thing is the logic analyzer, right? The logic analyzer. So the same way we had this timing diagram, which would have a clock signal and it would have multiple signals here and you see they lined up nicely. Right, lined up nicely with each other, right? And we can read them nice and compare them. We can see that when this one is one, this one is zero, and this one is zero, we can kind of line up the bits together and compare them nice and neatly. Okay. What the logic analyzer do is the same thing, but it's a device that has Different, different inputs and we can go connect them up to different parts of our circuits and, and line up these signals together and compare them, right? As it says here, it can display multiple channels of digital information in a, in a tabular form, which is just the same way as the timing diagram. Just line them up and we can do some, some high level analysis on them and see exactly what's going on. Or maybe you want to test the functionality of our and gate, we can have two signals coming in and compare them to the signal coming out and say, okay, when both of these are high, yes, indeed, this output signal is high. When we turn one of them off, yes, the output signal is low, and so on and so forth, verify the, the integrity of our circuit. Okay. Um, another thing you might want to use is a digital multimeter, right? And this is just used to like test things like continuity, test, measure different voltages, resistance, making sure things are receiving power, right? When solving stuff up on a board, and just overall verifying the integrity of your circuit, which is general for any electronics course. Right? Now, this is the last slide. Now, you, you might have heard that we just solder up a bunch of ICs, right? Solder up a bunch of these ICs. And inside of them, are just a fixed number of components, right? Just a fixed thing. This here is a NAND gate IC and it's not gonna change, right? Inside of it's a NAND gate. This pin does, does this, it's connected this NAND gate in this particular way. Now, programmable logic devices are more expansive devices that we can program to be a certain way, okay? Let's look at, for example, an FPGA, which is a type of programmable device. Now, notice it's just this, it's this big board Actually, not that, right? Is this big board with a lot of different stuff on it? It kind of looks like a computer. It is a big chip with a lot of different pins. And essentially, what it is, it's, it's this programmable logic device that we can talk to, right? We can plug up to our computer and we can say, okay, take these three pins, make them an AND gate. Take this other three pins, make them an OR gate. Take this section, make it an adder, right? And it might have all sorts of things already pre-built into it. It might have multiplexers pre-built into it, adders pre-built into it, comparators pre-built into it. And we can just say, okay, use the two comparators you got to do this kind of operation and create a digital system, right? So it's a device 
where we can program it how to be, right? And it has some pre-built stuff into it, right? There are different types, right? That we will, of course, learn a little bit about. FPGAs, right? Um, these PLDs, this general program logic, de logical device, devices, PALs, and so on and so forth. All these different acronyms, right? So we just write some code to it and it configures the device yeah. in a certain way and yeah, tells yeah, it yeah. behave like this. Generally, it's used to prototype stuff because when designing a digital system, we don't want to go soldering up stuff yeah. all the time. What we do is use, use an FPGA, design the system, test it. It's kind of like a way to simulate, simulate the digital system, test it, make sure it operates, right? We'd use the built-in AND gate and the built-in counter and connect it up in a certain way. And then when we verify that, okay, this, this logic works, this, this setup works, then we can go buy a counter chip, right? And an adder chip or a multiplexer chip and solder them up and have a finished project, project, project right? So that's what it's used for. It's generally used for prototyping, right? But sometimes we can use them to do actual work and we do have them in industry and in certain devices. I know a few years ago, people used to do them to use, use them to use, do crypto mining, right? FPGAs, use them to do mine cryptocurrency, stuff like that. So you can program it to do pretty much anything you want, anything that another digital system would, would do. Okay. So that's it. I know we went over a lot of stuff. Um, See, there's one question in the chat. Yeah, that's just Billy telling me thanks for talking about the oscillator. So, okay, yeah, question. Um, what, what chapter is this? Chapter one. Chapter one. I'm trying to read this one asked. Okay, it's a lot for chapter one, right? But this is just a general overview, and it's an overview of everything. So essentially, you kind of just learn everything that you will learn throughout the course. It's just that throughout the course, we're going to go more in detail about every little thing, right? We're going to learn a little bit more about the adder. We're going to learn a little bit more about the shift register, about the counter, right? Or would we have to build anything physically um, or simulation? Practically, no. But you, you, you will have to do a little paper design, right? Okay. Yeah, I should probably send you guys some, uh, some, because I taught this course before and some students did some projects. So maybe I can send you guys a few sample projects that previous students did, if I can find them. Okay, all right now, but, uh, but I'll try and do that because some students, you know, they put some, some AND gates, some NAND gates together and they create some digital logic. Some students, they, they, they did like little alarm systems saying that, okay, when this, when this uh, sensor trip, it would send a, a high signal here. And based on that, you would power up um, some sort of speaker that, you know, would play a sound or play a horn or turn an LED on, things like that. Simple system, they would use it to turn on a pump. All sorts of things, right? Students were very creative. So I'll send you that as kind of just an example. And of course, doing the first assignment, which is an essay, will help you kind of understand what you can do with digital systems. Okay, any more questions? No? No more questions? Seems like, seems like we don't have any more questions. Okay, good. Well, at the end of it, it's just this little quiz, right? You can, it's just there to check your knowledge, make sure you, no, it, it's not for you guys, right? Don't worry. And I'll give you guys a quiz on the first class. But it, it's here to check, make sure you understand the material, right? The answers are here as well. So you can just run through it, make sure you kind of 
understand what this chapter is about. And maybe, or maybe not, some of these questions might come back in at your midterm I give you or your final exam I give you, right? Maybe, maybe not, I, I don't know. All right? There you go, sir. Good. So next class, we're gonna move on to chapter two, right? We're moving pretty fast. So we just finished chapter one, we're gonna move on to chapter two. Let me just confirm what chapter two is about. No, chapter two is the binary numbers. And chapter three is logic gates, right? Okay. So the person I wanted to know how to add binary numbers, they can, they can check out chapter two. And we'll cover it in the next class, right? Yeah. Sir. Mm -hmm. Just a confirmation, right? The class is from six to eight every Monday. Oh. Yes, every Monday. Okay, and, sir. Okay. If you guys need additional Sorry, help, we can always schedule a separate time. So you already sent chapter two one to us. I yeah, already sent send this uh this PDF the, right, with the slides and you guys should have the textbook, right? Everyone has the textbook? Yes. yes. Good. So start reading the textbook. Don't be afraid to read on to chapter two, right? Or chapter three, if you're ambitious. Okay? Good. So, I mean, if you guys don't have any other questions, guys, feel free to um, read. Enjoy one more question, day. I'm sorry. Um, okay. I mean, it's not really regarded to the, the, the work that we did today but um okay you know just a simple question um due to the fact that you know you might be well versed in um you know okay. technology and this kind of stuff um if i had to ask um maybe one or three or maybe five um you know tech telecommunication um development over the past um 10 years you know you could answer that question what do you mean if i've seen any telecommunication development over the past five years yeah, like basically, like if you know of any, you know, um, like in Guyana or in general, um, around or in general around the world, basically. So, so 5G like is major, a thing. major significant or uh, significant, uh, you know, development. Telecommunications, like, yeah, 5G was a big development. 5G um, has been in development probably since 2016, and the worldwide rollout was just last year. Um, the use of AI has, has risen a lot. You know, a lot of machine learning is going on, computer vision stuff. So, kind of start actually using AI now and working. You know, neural networks have been about for like years, probably in the 1990s, but now we're actually finally using AI, and we're using it to help a robot see things and understand things. Um, you know, when you start doing a Google search. And that thing pops up, I am not a robot, and then asks you to pick images. Essentially, you're doing the same thing an AI would do. An AI would look at this image and they would be able to pick out all the different traffic lights or all the different cars, right? So we're essentially doing the same thing an AI would do, helping to train and, and, and um, calibrate that system. So AI is on the rise. We launch 5G. Electric vehicles are becoming very popular, right? They got good range. Some people prefer them, right? All over Europe, all in the US. Um, they actually got a few electric vehicles in Guyana, right? Here and there. Um, yeah. All right, sir. Thanks a lot. That, that's just a couple, right? Anything else? Um, sir, excuse me, sir. Mm -hmm. First of all, um, only on Mondays we will have you, sir. Yes, yes. By popular demand, you guys only want me one time a week. Oh, okay, sir. Anyway, all right. Thank you. Sir, I'm not good enough for, um, for you teach us and, and everything. Yeah, yeah. And of course, if you guys need an extra day, you can always tell me, especially when we move on to maybe the binary stuff, you might want to meet do a little tutorial, teach you guys how to add some numbers again, right? Or maybe the Carnot mapping and the Boolean algebra. 
my one little tutorial session going over the maths again, right? So we can always talk as a class and schedule another time to go over the more in-depth topics, the topics that require a little bit more help, right? Yeah, but as you guys see fit, if you need an extra class, want me to explain a topic again, we'll, we'll look for another day and look for another time and decide as a class, right? Good. Any other questions? No. So go home while well, you're already home. It looks like it, so. Yeah. Read the book, please. Start reading chapter two if you can, or finish reading chapter one. Right. Have a look at the questions. Right. Make sure you, you, you understand why the answers are the way they are, right? Don't just look at, oh, number one is A and number two is B. You need to understand why is number one A, right? These questions are fairly simple, but they should help test your understanding. Okay? Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Yep, go ahead. Um, um, uh, can you like send, um, like send the textbook to my email, sir? I know if it's, it's okay to ask, but. Um, I'll put it in the chat. I'll put it in the chat. No? Oh, wait. Does, does anyone have the link to help this guy out for the textbook? Let's see. This is what I'm checking for, sir. Okay. If I have it, if I got, um, hold on, sir. Let me find it real quick. What's the name of it again, sir? Digital Techniques. Is it or digital fundamentals? Digital fundamentals, Floyd. So, are you the senator? You, you, you send the link to us? Yeah, I send the link to you guys. Oh. Okay, this is. Okay. So, um, which is it? Um, the exact Floyd. name would be a principle of electronics a communication system or modern digital and analog communication system. What do you mean, this course? In the book. No, it's digital fundamentals. No, the just one digital by fundamentals. Thomas Floyd. Yeah, this is the link. I'll send it in the chat for those of you that don't have it. Okay. Okay, that's the link. Just come in, press download. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Save the link because when you close off Zoom, you won't get a link back, right? All right, any other questions? Anyone else need help? Feel free to leave if you don't have any questions. If you have a question, go ahead. Okay, all right, signing off. Enjoy the rest of your night, guys.